these forty days and forty nights, will you walk the path of sacrifice? Will you walk the path of sacrifice? Will you walk the path of Welcome, our, our Lady of Fatima confirmation class. We Today is our 11th class, and today it's on the Holy Spirit, the four gifts of the Holy Spirit, presented by Dana and Greg Newsberger. And we're going to start off with an opening prayer, and we're going to let Father Spitzer get us on the opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, on this day we ask you to bless and watch out over our country and our culture. Help us to preserve a culture of life and help us to preserve a, a culture of real dignity of humankind that is grounded in religious liberty. We ask you, dear Lord, to send your spirit down upon this country to inspire and protect it and to guide it in every way. We ask you too to send that same spirit down upon Doug and myself so that everything we do and everything we say will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And may receive the wisdom. Pray for us. In the, Father, in the name of the Father, and of the Holy Son, Holy and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And Amen. let that Holy Spirit descend upon our class today also. Amen. Yeah. All right, just a quick review. Uh, last week. Uh, we worked on why the truth matters, and we talked about, we learned, actually learned how to discern the truth. We also learned that the truth can help help us uh, make God's choice, not just our choice, but God's choice. We also learned that uh, we should live our life in accordance with the truth, and we also learned that we should promote the truth. Very important to promote the truth. And we're going to start off with a review video. Religious Ed, Confirmation, Catechism. The Holy Spirit, Lesson 1, Why Truth Matters. The truth is important because it okay. informs us and to know and follow God's loving plan. A decision made without knowing the truth is at best a guess. At worst, it can cause great harm. Think about the truth as a compass, your moral compass. The truth is, we become what we choose. The choices we make define who we are, and guide us in who we become. When we choose to do evil, we are abusing the freedom God gave us. Sin is an abuse of our free will. And if we do not know the truth, then we will lack a working moral compass, and we may sin. Fortunately, God has given us tools we can use to discern truth. First, God has given us the truth in several ways. We can look to the Bible, which includes the teachings of Jesus Christ, and the teachings and traditions of the church to find the truth. We can ask those who know the truth for the facts, such as those who practice a properly formed faith, such as a bishop, priest, deacon, or a catechist. And God has given us reason. We can often discern truths by thinking logically about a question. We must strive to learn what is true, and we should banish from our minds that which is false. Sadly, we live in a world filled with false teachings intended to mislead us. We must make everyday use of God's truth to avoid being misled. 
It is important to live in accord with the truth. We will avoid much hardship if we follow God's truths. For example, when we know that human life begins at conception, a moral truth and a scientific fact, we will choose to embrace life rather than reject it. We can avoid both grave, mortal sin and deep regret by embracing life. In addition to following God's truth, we also have a duty to share this truth with others. The Sacrament of Confirmation bestows the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit assists us in bringing God's truths of salvation to others by what we say and do. But for us to speak intelligently about the faith, we must first know and understand the truth. Today's class, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to work with four, the four gifts of the Holy Spirit. And those four gifts are wisdom, understanding, counsel, and knowledge. So at the end of the class today, we should have a pretty, a pretty good understanding of those, uh, those four gifts that come from the Holy Spirit. We'll also talk about the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, what they're, as I mentioned, what, they're to do, what we're going to do with these gifts. So I want to start off with a quick video and then re recap some important points in the video. Religious Ed Confirmation, Catechism. The Holy Spirit, Lesson 2, Four Gifts of the Holy Spirit. There are many gifts of the Holy Spirit, but there are four you need to know about before confirmation. These gifts are important. They will help you in your everyday life. They will guide you towards salvation. The first gift is wisdom. Wisdom is a gift that enables us to understand things from God's perspective. When we use this gift to recognize truth and discern the purpose and plan of God, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to see God at work. Our lives take on a deeper meaning as we exercise this gift of the Spirit. Next is understanding. Understanding is a gift that helps us to grasp the truths of our faith and find deeper, and deeper meaning in what we believe. It helps us comprehend how we need to live as a follower of Jesus Christ. It informs our reason and helps us to inform our conscience. This is important because our reason isn't enough without the understanding provided by the Holy Spirit. Counsel is another gift. Counsel helps us to know what is right. It is the perfection of the cardinal virtue of prudence. As a gift of the Holy Spirit it enables us to act, almost by intuition, knowing what is right. A person who knows what is right can do what is right without fear, avoid sin and please the Lord. Then, there is knowledge. Knowledge is more than the accumulation of facts. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit. The word gift has the same root as the word grace. Knowledge helps us to judge all things in relationship to God's loving and wise plan. The gift of knowledge enables and empowers us to understand the meaning and purpose God has for our life. And to live it out as we cooperate with God's grace. The gift of knowledge differs from wisdom. It leads to action, not just a desire to live up to the ways of God, but the grace and power to live as the Lord calls us to live. As a gift of the Holy Spirit, it also differs from understanding. It is having the ability to grasp the truths of our faith and know God's loving plan of wisdom. 
These gifts are strengthened by confirmation. And it is our duty to use these gifts to bring God's truth of salvation to others. And for some of those points that were in the video, and as we heard, there were four main, uh, there were four uh, gifts, the gift of wisdom, understanding, counsel, and knowledge. So these gifts of the Holy Spirit were very, very important. And, and these, um, and they will help us not just in our everyday life, but they will guide us to salvation. So that was an important point in the video. Another important point that I heard in the, in the video was that the gift of wisdom, wisdom enables us to understand things from God's perspective. So that's, that's a very difficult thing to really comprehend, but that's what one of those gifts of wisdom helps us do. So the second gift was the gift of understanding, and that gift will help us to grasp the truth of our faith and find deeper and deeper meaning in what we believe. So that was another point that was brought out in video that was very important. The third gift was the gift of counsel. Counsel helps us to know what is right and what is wrong. And a lot of you guys have, have that little, that already have that gift. You know, you, you, you feel inside of you what's right and what's wrong. But the gift of Holy Spirit and the gift of confirmation will help make that even stronger and help you even more. So a person that knows what is right can do what is right without fear, avoid sin, and please the Lord. So that's a super important one. The fourth gift was the gift of knowledge. Knowledge helps us judge all things in relationship to God, God's loving and wise plan. It's very important to remember that the gift of knowledge leads us to action, not just a desire to live up to the ways of God, but the grace and the power to live as the Lord calls us to live. Remember also that it's our duty to use these gifts to bring God, God's truth of salvation to other people. Okay. And so that was that. And now just a quick quiz. I want to switch gears here. We'll Dana will read the questions and then I'll, I'll call on some people. So let's see. How about, um, first up, Gavin. Let's call on Gavin to do this one. D go ahead, Dana. Define wisdom. Is it A, a gift that enables us to know the purpose and plan of God, or B, a gift that enables us to tell others when they should make important decisions? Um, a. That's that's Great correct. Job, Great job. Great job. Thank you. Okay, next up, uh, Michael. Let's call on Michael. Def def go ahead, Dana. Define understanding. A, a gift that helps us to know what we are reading and hearing. A gift that helps us to grasp the truths of the faith and helps us to find meaning in what we believe. Michael texted B. Okay. Uh, great job, Michael. That's, that's a great job. That that's was correct. A bit that was a little harder question. Okay. Good job, Michael. All right, Melina, I'll let you do the next one. Go ahead Define with the question. Dave. Counsel. A, a gift that helps us to know what is right. Or B, a gift that helps us to know whether others are speaking the truth or not. You want to read the question one more time? Is it a gift? Is counsel a gift which helps us to know what is right? Or is it a gift which helps us to know whether others are speaking the truth or not? Okay. Yeah. Um, how about Jack? Our a. Oh, thank you. That's right. It is the gift that helps us know right from wrong, almost Great. instinctively. Very That's good. Great. Very good. Let's see if uh, Anna, Annalisa. Annalisa, can you go ahead and read the question, Dana? Define knowledge. Is it a gift that helps us to judge all things in relation to God? Or a gift that helps us learn faster, especially in the church and in our studies. She texted A. Great job, Annalisa. Okay, good job. And the next question. About, Explain what confirmation does for these. How about gifts. Jayla? How about you try, try this one, Jayla? How about uh, Edgar? Do you know 
this one, uh, explain what confirmation does for these gifts. A, it strengthens them, or B, it makes it so you can teach these gifts to others by praying for them. Next question is explain how these explain gifts. Explain how we should use these gifts. Should, how we should use these gifts. Go ahead, read it, uh, and then we'll call on uh, Daniel. We'll give Daniel call on Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Um, please explain how we should use these gifts. A, we should use these gifts to enrich ourselves. B, we should use these gifts in service to bring God's truth of salvation to others. B. Great job. Yeah, very good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Okay. Well, there's a Father, video are there from any other distinctive Father. features in the Catholic Church that point to Jesus and his spirit within it? Yes, um, uh, there are several. Uh, up to now, we've talked about the need for a definitive teaching and interpretation of the scriptures. We've talked about the benefits of the Holy Eucharist and the benefits of Sacrament of Reconciliation. Now we can get into some other issues, uh, particularly the whole area of cultural and world transformation through charity and through social doctrine. This has been one of the great gifts of the Catholic Church to the world. Um, I already said in a previous episode that uh, the church uh, you know, was responsible uh, for building you know, the healthcare system um, you know, that, that we now know in the world today, much of it has been taken over by secular establishments, mm -hmm. but the church still, uh, you know, for a long time, the church was the healthcare establishment of Europe, wow. right? And, and, and today it still runs 26% of uh, the healthcare organizations in the world. Wow. At one point, you know, the church was the public, uh, uh, was the uh, public education system of the world. Every, all education was practically centered on it. Really? And, and yeah, and to this day, as I've already said, there are 43,000 uh, Catholic high schools, 97,000 uh, primary schools, 1,400 universities, right? I mean, it's still a huge, you know, a percentage of, of the education system in the world. Mm. And for a long time, the church was the charitable institution, the public welfare institution of the world. And today it still controls huge percentage of the orphanages, huge percentage of the homes for wayward women, a huge percentage of, of the homes for those who are destitute and, and, and powerless. I mean, Catholic Charities is a huge organization that controls, you know, so many different apostolates around the world. Now, say, you get to say, well, yes, it, it, the church did do that. It transformed because they took the love of Jesus mm -hmm. and ran with it. And, and, you know, did as he had asked them through the grace of the Holy Spirit. And this was the result. It was transformation of the world and culture in charity and in love that is in action, not just in work. So that was one area that was really significant transformation. Wow, that's powerful. We see the effects today, mm -hmm. the effect of love within our society and care for our communities and social yep. justice issues. Can you talk more specifically about those and then even the political rights that stem from Jesus? Yeah, for a while the church was the institution that brought social justice mm -hmm. to the Roman Empire, which was not a socially just society. In fact, it was built on cruelty and power. And so, uh, you know, the, the church slowly but surely, kind of after 300 years of the Edict of Milan in 313 AD, right, Con uh, Constantine declares the church the official church of, of, of the Roman Empire. But at, at that juncture, the church had already articulated a social theory that was basically beginning to have significant effects on the undermining of slavery, the undermining of the cruelties of the Colosseum, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, they were you know, just kind of extricating it from, from um, you know, that, that pagan world. But the main thing that was really important as well is that um, uh, the church began to theoretically articulate a social doctrine, which becomes the ground of our inalienable rights a system and even the economic rights. And, and let me just give you a few examples. St. Augustine, uh, you know, who is, is writing in the four, early 400s, is basically, you know, makes this statement, which becomes, right, the, the entire byline for the civil uh, 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 for civil disobedience and for the social justice movements uh, you know throughout India the United States throughout, throughout the world he says an unjust law is no law at all 
And what he meant by that is that the law, the positive law, has to be subservient to justice, equity, to just treatment of people, to making sure that people have enough to be, uh, as it were, free and, 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 uh, and alive and not subjected to um, uh, unneeded cruelties uh, in, in, in society. And wow. so that uh, becomes, you know, as I said, the byline for uh, even Martin Luther King in letter uh, of Birmingham J from a Birmingham jail quotes it. Gandhi quotes it, wow. right? It's, it's everywhere present. Uh, to this very day, you know, justice overranks the positive law. The positive law must be responsible for justice. I'll just quickly say, St. Thomas Aquinas advanced the natural law theory, which was very important in bringing justice theory into the systems of government. And then the, the, the Jesuit Francisco Suarez uh, uh, pointed out that, um, uh, you know, that, hey, you know, the inalienable rights of human beings exist within uh, uh, every single one of us. No government declares that you have the right to life. You have the right to life because you're human. You have the mm -hmm. right to life because it's part of your endowment as a unique and intrinsically valuable human being. And moreover, the creator has given that to you. Mm -hmm. That that was Francisco Suarez. You have, the, the, no government gave you the right to liberty. You have the right to liberty. That is to say self-governance in your own self. You have the right within your own self to the pursuit of happiness, because that's what's necessary to be human, to be intrinsically dignified as a human being. And by the way, the Creator gave it to you. Those inalienable rights to life, liberty, property, and the pursuit of happiness, Francisco Suarez, a Jesuit priest, right, in 1612 in a book called De Legibus. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to that, you have Bartolome de las Casas, right? And las Casas came and, and made the universal personhood. Of, of the Indian slaves in, in the New World, defended them against Sepulveda and against the Spanish court and the Portuguese court who wanted to, you know, obviously enslave them and subjugate them. Mm. And he made an ardent defense against them, saying that they were persons just as everybody else was a person. And to violate that was a violation of the principle of nominal weapons. A very strong articulation of that argument. And then, of course, you have St. Peter Claver a Jesuit saint who worked with the African uh, slaves that were coming over um, uh, from Africa. And he rode uh, literally in the, in, the, in the bottom of the slave boats with the slaves and ministered to them. And then when he got off at Cartagena, he began a ministry to the slaves in Cartagena and defended their rights mm -hmm. for uh, you know the rest of his life. He ministered and, uh, to 300,000 slaves coming out the slave boats almost single-handedly, went to the slave owners' houses and to guarantee that they were following the law of God in the treatment of those slaves. And so this is, this is a, a, you know, like I said, this is a great articulation of social doctrine. It begins with the Catholic Church, and then they top it all off. After the terrible abuses of the Industrial Revolution, the Catholic Church started a series of what's called social encyclicals, or Catholic social teachings, mm -hmm. that talks about just you know, what would Christ say about how business ought to conduct itself, about how international politics ought to conduct itself, about how labor ought to conduct itself, about how war and peace uh, ought to be conducted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they go through these things, and it's just the most remarkable articulation of social judgment you have ever seen. If you want to take a look, it's mm -hmm. called Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm compendium of the social doctrine of the Catholic Church. Just put that into your Google search. You can get the entire thing. It's the most beautiful uh, doctrine. It's articulated in terms of six principles and seven areas of application. There's nothing like it in the world. And this is given to us by the Catholic Church. Wow, who would have thought that all of the rights that we have today and we're accustomed to and really expect um, stem from Jesus and yeah. his teaching. It's amazing. It is amazing. Yeah, okay. it really is. And Dana, okay. Why, why don't you call on um, call on one more person? Oh yeah, hi Chris. Can you please tell us something that you thought about the video? Well, uh, I want to add, call upon Augustine, and add, I mean Augustine. So, or anyone really, Augustine, or anyone who wants to answer, answer this question can. Can you tell me one feeling or thought that you had from praying with the Bible or the daily mass readings this last week? Welcomed. Augustine texted, welcomed. 
Is welcome. that what you yeah. felt? Welcome. 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 welcome to by the Bible. By the oh, Bible. Yeah. That's so beautiful. And it's so true. All right. Now, hopefully, you guys all were able to benefit from that 10 to 20 minutes of Bishop Barron's short videos that I sent you. They were about confirmation names. Now, as before, as a candidate for confirmation, you must pick the name of a recognized saint, blessed, or servant of God who will serve as your patron, and you will take their name on as your own during and after your confirmation. When God does something really big in a person's life, he often changes their name. For example, Simon became Peter when Jesus set him aside to be the first pope. Saul became Paul after his remarkable conversion from a persecutor to the greatest evangelist of all time. Now, the person that you choose to be your confirmation saint is someone that is a witness of whose witness of life deeply inspires you. It may be someone you view as a role model, or in my case, it may just be someone you also view as personally involved with you, drawn to, perhaps you admire or want the power of their intercession. For example, that was one reason that I picked St. Faustina. This is actually one of the fun parts about confirmation. It's actually not part of the rite of confirmation to take on a new name, but if it's one of these time-honored traditions that comes along with it. So I think that the reason why I pick... So when I was preparing for confirmation, I realized that it was a very important milestone in a special way, and it was really interesting. Um, the Holy Spirit definitely allowed me to understand it in this way. Firstly, when I was going through my confirmation booklet, I learned a lot about different lives of the saints because there were a small section on lives of the saints at the end. There was a small section. And um, I was actually more impacted by this when I had the book beforehand, before class, just reading it by myself. And it often was so moving that it moved me very, very much. So they were, even though I didn't pick them, they turned out to be very, very important. And I could feel the power of the Holy Spirit preparing me for this life-changing moment. So when I was picking, I ultimately picked St. Faustina because I wanted a modern saint. But I would have picked St. Paul the Apostle if I, you know, he, right now I love them both. So it's okay to pray to one and have one as your saint too. Pray to them both. So when I was preparing for confirmation, I didn't understand it as much as I did based on scripture and tradition, but the Holy Spirit really did tell me something that was quite inspired, quite illuminating. Um, the Holy Spirit let me know how I should prepare for my confirmation by telling me that I should prepare for it like my ordination if I had an ordination. So that was how much of a big deal the Holy Spirit was showing it to me to be. It would be a few more years before I, I got to the Acts of the Apostles and started studying it and found out how, how um, true that comparison is. So I think that we can honestly say that we're going to study how confirmation is the baptism in the Holy Spirit with Father Spitzer in a minute. So if you understand about... Well, firstly, just take your confirmation saint's name to prayer. Um, it's, a, it's important, but it's not part of the sacrament. Mind you, hopefully you guys were able to benefit from Bishop Barron's videos that I emailed you guys. Um, here's what I'm talking about when I speak about confirmation as similar to ordination. According to Father Spitzer, another passage in the Acts of the Apostles tells us about the difference between the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the baptism by water. So the baptism by the Holy Spirit comes in a separate rite of the laying on of hands that is given to the disciples who have already been baptized and catechized, therefore in receiving the forgiveness of their sins through their baptism by water and initiation into the community. Then, you get an example of what the Acts of the Apostles teaches in Acts chapter 8 when um, Philip, the deacon, baptizes and catechizes a group of disciples in Samaria. 
after he finishes this process of instruction, he calls the apostles. And the apostles come down and they pray and lay hands on the candidates, all of the people there that have been baptized and catechized. And that's when they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and they have the remarkable gifts that they need to go out and witness to their families and um, spread the kingdom of, and enlarge the kingdom of Christ. As it says in the Acts of the Apostles, the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. So, of course, they had the gifts of the Holy Spirit from their baptism, but compared to the way it was, compared to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that they received afterward, they could say it was not, it was as if it had not yet come upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So, um, give me a yes or something if everyone understands why confirmation is in many ways proximate and equal to ordination and why it's like an ordination to serve others and receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit to build up and witness to Christ. So it'll be under participant list or your participant. There should be like a yes or no button. There it goes. Okay, I want to talk a little bit, teach you a little bit of, of my knowledge about Lent. So there are a lot of facts I hope will help you have a more joyful Lent here. A common misperception concerning Lent is the duration of Lent. This one actually was something that took me a while to catch on to. But um, Lent is actually a 40-day season, but it lasts 46 calendar days. And the reason why there are 46 calendar days inside a 40-day season is because the Sundays in Lent are actually considered outside of the season of Lent. And that's very, very cool because the reason why it is is because Sunday is traditionally a feast day. It's the day when we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. So it's it wouldn't be considered proper to do penance and fasting and sacrifices on that day. So that's why it can't be considered part of Lent. It's like a little oasis in the desert. I'm not going to be fasting or doing any sacrifices today. So it's my oasis in the desert. Lent goes back to the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Church canon law binds us to certain practices that we engage in as we can as a community. For example, we abstain from meat on Fridays during Lent. For Lent, did you know that Moses went out of the, in the desert and fasted and prayed for 40 days, and then he received the laws of love, the Ten Commandments, and brought them down to the people? Also, in the Old Testament, the city of Nineveh was given 40 days to repent. During those 40 days, they fasted and returned to the Lord with all their heart. And as a result, the city of Nineveh was saved. Now, Jesus engaged in combat with Satan through fasting and prayer for 40 days before he began his public ministry. And one of the Old Testament prophets, Elijah, went on a 40-day journey and was given food from an angel to survive as he went to the mountain of the Lord. So 40 days is an important time period in scripture. In our own ministry and lives, Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of the Lenten season in the Latin Rite. And it is, there's an Eastern Rite and a Latin Rite. But in the Latin Rite, that's the church we have. There's an Eastern Orthodox Church where they have a different liturgical calendar and some different practices. So um, Lent, um, Ash Wednesday is the first day of mandatory fasting for people. We go into that, we go to Holy Week. And Holy Week is the culmination of the liturgical season of Lent. Holy Week is the time when we relive, relive the last week of Jesus' life on earth. Holy Week begins with Palm Sunday, which is the last Sunday of Lent, or Passion Sunday as it's sometimes called. The Sunday after Palm Sunday is Easter Sunday the climax of the liturgical year. So next slide, please. Within Holy Week, there is something called the Sacred Paschal Tridium, three very, 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 very significant days. There is Holy Thursday when we commemorate the Last Supper and the institution of the ministerial priesthood. Good Friday, 
after that is Good Friday. The day is, this is the second day of required fasting according to canon law, fasting and abstinence from meat, but also fasting on one meal and two snacks if you are able without a health condition to do so. This is the day when we most solemnly commemorate and relive the passion, cross, and death of Jesus. There is no Mass on Good Friday in the Latin Rite because there is no good news on that day when Jesus is taken away from us. However, thirdly and finally, there is Holy Thursday, which is perhaps the most mysterious of the three. On this day, we commemorate Jesus' triumphant descent when he went to preach the good news to those who had died before him. And with taking the just with him, he took them, ascended into heaven with them. Well, once he was resurrected, he could then bring them in. So, finally, the greatest celebration of the liturgical year begins. It arrives with Easter Sunday. So there should be some amazing homilies and sermons that day, those three days. <laughs> If you don't, we'll share some of them with you. And so this is kind of our first session on Catholic social teaching. I'm going to read you this, and then we'll listen to a video. Here's what life was like in the very first Christian community. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of the bread and to the prayers. Four things. Awe came upon them, everyone, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. All that believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their property and possessions and divide them among all according to each one's need. Each day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple area and breaking bread in their homes. They ate their meals with exaltation and sincerity of heart, praising God and enjoying favor with all the people. And every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Praise you, Lord. Look, social teaching is too big of a, a topic to fit into one lesson, but I'm planning on doing it little by little. So let's listen to this. You know, a feature of Catholic social teaching that I think is often overlooked or at least misunderstood is a certain animus against the concentration of power within a society. Catholic social teaching wants power distributed as widely as possible which seems fairer and actually more efficient. Now we can see it maybe most readily in the economic order, but this obtains too in the political order and the cultural order. Hyper concentrations of power, Catholic social teaching think, uh, thinks is a bad thing. Let's look at it now first economically, again, maybe the most obvious. When let's say one corporation or a, a conglomeration of corporations monopolizes an aspect of the economy, it's bad. They can sort of set prices at, at their whim. They eliminate uh, competition. They exclude people from you know, free participation in the market. They drive prices up. I mean, all that is seen as, as unhealthy within a capitalist system. Go back now to the early 20th century and Theodore Roosevelt's trust busting. Well, it was against that kind of monopolizing within the economy. Or think today. Just very recently in Congress, there are moves against you know, Google and Facebook and some of the big uh, tech conglomerates. Because the same thing, there was too much power economically being concentrated in one place. You know, I know when you talk about, well, therefore you're calling for the redistribution of wealth, it makes people nervous because they think right away of the government doing that. Well, Catholic social teaching does indeed think the government can do that to some degree. Uh, take trust busting as one example. Minimum wage requirements, uh, you know, limitations to the to the workday, other ways that the government can regulate the economy. Taxation itself is a kind of redistribution of the wealth. But Catholic social teaching also holds that the natural rhythms of a market economy can accomplish this. Think of John Paul II and Santesi Mazzano says that profit making itself is a way of redistributing the wealth. Now why? Well, because if you're noticing, look, that guy's making tons of money in that segment of the economy, that means I can get involved. There's money to be made. I can maybe propose a, a more efficient uh, uh, product. And, and the, the healthy competition that ensues 
is a way of distributing wealth and power within the economy. Again, the ideal is to avoid these hyper-concentrations, which can become tyrannical. So that's the economic order. But it's also true in the political order. Now, obviously the case in certain forms of dictatorship, think of uh, the oppressive tyrannies of the 20th century, think of um, certain theocracies on the scene today. When there's a hyper-concentration in one party or one perspective, that can lead to forms of tyranny. Uh, but, you know, if you think, oh, well, that's all just kind of distant business, it doesn't really apply to me. I don't know, look at um, my home state of, uh, of California. Try running as a pro-life politician in California or Illinois or Massachusetts. I think you'll see what the hyper-concentration of political power looks like. When there's a state or city that's been governed by one party for decades, that's almost a formula for political corruption. So Catholic social teaching wants, in the political order, power to be more widely distributed. A wide variety, perhaps, of political parties, political perspectives. Uh, maybe things like term limits, not allowing politicians or certain parties to, to dominate uh, a system. So again, spreading out, in this case, political power. We can also see it in the cultural order. Again, extreme examples. Look in the 20th century in uh, Nazi Germany or in, in Soviet Russia, when there was you know, one form of art, one form of, of pictorial representational art was uh, deemed acceptable. Socialist realism in, in Russia, the Nazis had their own you know, very particular form. Every other type of artistic expression was uh, censored or pilloried. This sort of thing, too, is a hyper-concentration of cultural power in one way. Now, again, lest you feel like, oh, well, those are you know, weird things that happened far away and long ago. I don't know. Look at uh, Hollywood today. Look at the TV shows and, and movies. Very often coming out of a very singular and restricted ideological perspective. Is there one type of art, in other words, one, one ideological aesthetic perspective that's seen as legitimate? Well, that excludes all sorts of people from participating in the cultural realm. It's a hyper-concentration of power. Catholic social teaching is against this sort of thing. It wants power, economic, political, cultural, to be widely distributed. Again, it doesn't mean this ha has to happen through state diktat. There's all kinds of means by which this sort of distribution can occur. And in fact, one of the most basic forms of justice affirmed by Catholic social teaching is called distributive justice. So to take the goods of the world, which have a universal destination, by the way, they're, they're designed really for everybody, and to make sure they're distributed as widely and uh, humanely as possible. You know what comes to mind here is one of my intellectual heroes, the great uh, G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton, back in the 1910s you know, and 20s, was advocating an economic theory that he called distributism. Now, it's coming from this idea, this Catholic idea of distributive justice. Chesterton was uneasy, obviously, with the, with the forms of socialism and communism that were ascendant in his time. But he was, he was also very uneasy with a sort of undisciplined, unconstrained a capitalism or free market economy that also provided for a hyper-concentration of wealth. What he liked very much was a more local, widely distributed political and economic uh, situation. Just recently, I was reading a very good commentary by the great Chesterton commentator, Dale Alquist, and he suggested that the term distributism has never really caught on. It, it's a little bit odd, you know, unless you see the connection to distributive justice. But he suggested as an alternative, the term localism. And not bad, because Chesterton was against these kind of uh, great conglomerations of power at the sort of upper level, economically, politically, culturally. And he liked what was closer to the ground, widely distributed within a society. So, distributism, localism. By the way, you want to see it on vivid artistic display, go get um, the Lord of the Rings movies. 
What you see in the Shire, because of course Tolkien was very influenced by Chesterton, what you see in the Shire, the hobbits living in simplicity, close to the ground, people running their own small businesses, making their own tools, etc. And, and notice Tolkien's great animus against uh, Sauron, these people who had these you know, great sort of industrial complexes. Well, that was his commentary against the um, kind of industrial capitalism of his own time. So again, Catholic social teaching, I think so often misunderstood and underappreciated, cuts against both the extreme left and the extreme right, calls for the universal distribution of goods as well as private property, wants power, which is seen as legitimate, power's not a bad thing because God's all powerful, but it wants power distributed politically, economically, and culturally as widely as possible talking about when he was speaking about localism as a principle of subsidiary, a system based on the principle of subsidiary. Essentially what that means is that a larger or higher ranking unit like a federal government can't come and tell a smaller unit like a local government or a family how they should engage in their own life, their own business, or violate their rights. So there's more to this. As you can say, see here there's some examples listed below like a local business should be able to accomplish what it can for its own business and, and for the social good around it and the common good without interference from a higher social unit okay that's just a review their literal meaning which means what is the author trying to convey to their audience at their time then their spiritual meaning what does it mean to me today and or in the context of doctrine in the church so there are three different types of spiritual meanings and ecological and um where's my other? yes allegorical moral there it is moral New no the next slide is the closing prayer so what well, we're going to do is uh you know we're not going to have any homework uh, that i can think of this week it's going to be kind of homework free just continue working on your uh make sure that you're up to date on your um certificate that uh you know, through the, the Catholic online. So you're up to date on the, the quizzes to get your certificate at the end. And uh, then we're going to do a decade of the rosary with, the, in this case today, we have an interesting uh, um, uh, speaker for the decade of the rosary. Father, uh, we'll go ahead and, and do the decade of the rosary at which time after that, we'll go ahead and end our class. So here we go. Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, life everlasting. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Holy Mary, Mother, Mother of God, God, pray for us sinners now, now at the hour of our death. death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Am
of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mary Mother of God, God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. O oh, my Jesus, forgive us our sins. Save us from the fires of hell, and lead all souls to heaven, especially those who most need of thy mercy. The first joyful mystery, the Annunciation. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother, Mother of God, God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother, Mother of God, God, pray for us sinners, <laughs> Now at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, pray, pray for us sinners, Jesus. now at the hour of our death. death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, God, pray for us sinners, now, now and at, at the hour of our death. death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As, As it was, was in the beginning, beginning is, now, is now, and never and shall be. Amen. 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 Oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins. Save, Save us from, from the fires of hell, hell and lead all souls, souls to heaven, heaven especially, especially those in most need of thy mercy. <laughs> Okay, if you guys happen to feel the Holy Spirit come into you at some point in the class today, could you please check the yes button at the in your participant list? So if you felt some energy coming into you just at some point during today's lesson, please click the yes button. Answered theologically by God in scripture. I just my great hope is that you go forward enabled with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit to just meet all the, all the things, sidestep all the controversies and have the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Have a great, Thank great you. week. Have a God wonderful bless. Sunday.